This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Ephesians chapter six is the blueprint for what's coming next, who we need to be, and how it's all going to go down. But the big question is, are you ready? Because Yeshua's not going to do it all, and you have a part to play. Alan Aguirre explains in episode three of How to Navigate the Greater Exodus, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Hey, are you ready for Ephesians chapter six? Well, you better be, because the world is coming to a head, that's no big secret, and you have a part to play. That's right, Yeshua is not going to do it all. If that's what you think, you've read it wrong. Some of it is up to you. And more tonight with Alan Aguirre coming up. But first, we have just uh, completed the fall feast of Yehovah according to the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. Shemini Atzeret, a high Sabbath was this past Thursday, and then uh, we worked one day, and now it's another Sabbath. So don't you love it when that happens? <laughs> Let's talk about some other cool stuff going down with a man who wears many important hats here at Rude Awakening International. Please welcome David Robinson. Good to be here, Scott. Good to be here with you. So uh, you have a note about a feast. Ephesians 6 2 oh, yeah. that you wanted to bring out because I know that uh, that's what Alan's talking about tonight. So. Yeah, when you when I saw that that was in this uh, piece right here, it just overwhelmed me with everything that's going on in the mm, world today and yeah. how we are such visual people that uh, we we see all this going on and and all that is basically a distraction to God's plan for us to be able to walk the, or, or to run the race, right? To endure and to run the race and. Um, one of the things that God has really put on my heart is the condition of the church. Mm. And, um, and you know, we have uh, the Biden administration and we can't believe the things that they're trying to pass and things that they're doing. And it just, you know, it's the beginning of the big picture, which is, you know, in, in Revelations, you know, we're not even an issue. Right, and right. so part of us grieve that, but the other part should be celebrating because we see Yahuwah's word taking place, coming true. And so it's a, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Right. But um, one of the things that I think we as a church should fear the most, the government we should fear the most is uh, apathy. Mm. Because um, we are, you know, statistically, uh, prayer is not, is lacking in most, um, st- uh, uh, what do you call it? Not Most circles. Circles, yeah. well, but in the statistics, they take these polls and so forth. Oh, okay. And so... Um, it just really, um, it, it's something that we need to understand that we don't fight against flesh and blood. Is It talks about in Ephesians 6, 12, mm. but against principalities, against power, authorities, and high places. So the number one tool mm. is prayer. And we, we give money to stop abortion. We give money to all these things. But I'm telling you, if the church came together under the banner of prayer, that will stop abortion. Yeah. That'll stop many things that are taking place that are against uh, the truths of God's word. Right, we need to come together, right? Now, first of all, look up, because for your redemption draws nigh. Right. right. So that's what you're saying. We need to stay positive about this. It's not, oh my, we need to stop this. And we can, we talked about this before the cameras came on. I don't know that we can stop this because this is the way the world is supposed to go. It is. We've read the book. It's yeah. in here. Yeah. This is the way this goes. And that's why I said that about in the end times, you do not see us as a, you know, as far as our nation. Right. As a key player, you right. know, so. I think we all know what that means. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I'm saying. In one part, we're uh, grieving the fact that this is happening, but on the other side of that, God's word's actually happening, taking place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we should celebrate in that. And, you know, we were talking about this is the church needs to be throwing as many lifesavers as it can, you know, to save as many as we can, because that's our great commission, is to right. go into all the world and be witnesses. And the only way we can do that is to stick together. Right now, right. It, we see all of these forces out there. Right. Who's putting them out there doesn't matter. It the, doesn't. the fact is there's a lot of division. 
whether it's within churches, between churches, between racial groups, between this person or that person, whether you've had this type of medication or whether you refuse that type of medication, now those people are now enemies. We need to, like you said, we need to see above all that and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not yeah. the way to be doing this. We need to all be on the same team and work together. Like you said, everybody gets together, we can quash these things or at least lead others to Yehovah right. before and, it's and, too late. And something even just as important is we're creating unity. That's the thing. We yeah. need unity to fight the enemy. Absolutely, yeah. So we need to be working together and then listen to it. That's right. something too is humility. Everybody's like, no, I'm right, you're wrong. And right. okay, why don't we listen to each other, figure out what's going on here and <laughs> realize who our enemy is. And the enemy is not this government or that ruler or this mm -hmm. person or what, it's apathy. It is. It's, it's, apathy. Our, it's our attitude, right? It is, it really is. And, and, and it's a heart issue. Mm. Uh, apathy basically means without feeling. Right. You know, and, and so many of us in the church, you know, especially um, us commoners, you mm -hmm. know, we have all these great figures that are just men of God and, and uh, doing so much for the kingdom of God. And we kind of just by default place our trust in them, mm. uh, which the scripture tells us to trust no man, right? Right. So um, we need to wake up. We really need to wake up because we're, we're going about this whole spiritual warfare, mm -hmm. uh, fighting it in the flesh, and we, we have to resort to the power that Yahovah's given us, and that's through prayer, through unity, and these things could change, you know? Right, and, and, sh and, and like really praying for each other and working with each other yeah. because, like, uh, yeah, for example, so we shouldn't be following somebody because we're just gonna be left behind. Right. You know, just, we're, we're gonna be caught, with, you know, holding the bag and going, oh, what just happened? So we, we need to be responsible for our own faith. Exactly. Be responsible for ourselves. You see a lot of people seeing what's going on in the world just in the flesh and going, uh, we need to be preparing. And so they're preppers and they've got food aside and this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So they're not relying on any kind of government or any kind of agency. Right. Right. They're getting their own household ready. And in some instances, having you know church groups, you know, little uh, communities, getting themselves ready together you know, and each person contributing to that. Right. So we need to, like, I guess the word is grow up, right? Yeah. Grow up in our faith. And yeah, well, you know, how? To, what does the scripture tells us that they will know us by what? The love that we have for each other. Mm. And apathy without feeling, there's a lack of care and love for each other uh, that we're, we're missing, it's, it's missing. And, and we need to return to that. And. You know, it, it always seems like it takes this big event to, to get the church to wake up. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the term revival, why, why do we need reviving? We should never need reviving. But it's just a, it's a fact that we need things to, to move us and to bring awareness that we need to be fighting in the spirit. Yep. So um, I, I just think that is the answer <laughs> to everything that we're facing now is love for each other, which creates unity mm -hmm. and fights, combats apathy. Mm -hmm. And just, we need to be praying. That is the greatest tool the church has mm. to fight the spiritual warfare we're against. Indeed. Mm. All right, well, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Now, we have something over here that is a, a love gift. Oh, uh, yes. This is our brand new love gift. Today is October 1st, and uh, we call it a love gift because uh, as you guys pray for us, and uh, we pr that is our number one thing that we need from you is prayer, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it, it takes money to make this thing go. It does. I mean, that's just the way it is. And so one of the things we like to do is give you something back for your donation to this ministry, just to say, hey, thanks. We appreciate that. Here's a little something as a token of our appreciation and help you spread the word in your own household. Exactly. And one of those things is this beautiful blanket we have here. Yeah, the blankets, are, all the blankets have been, you know, people have really loved yeah. them. And so I love this design. Now, Yehovah has appointed times. And in each one of these, if you look at some of these images and go, ah, those look familiar, they should if you have the flags, the yard right. flags from Yeho uh, the Yeho Yehovah's appointed times yard flags. This is a this is a collage of all of those images. So up here we have something with uh, Passover, uh, Yom Teruah. We have uh, what's at the top there with the crown. There'll be Purim, Purim um, yeah. Shavuot. All, all, everything is depicted here. Mm -hmm. And so it's a beautiful blanket. It's what fifty inches by sixty inches. Yeah, fifty by sixty. Okay, very good. Yeah. So that kind of, that's a tier. Or what we, that's the uh, tier two. 
All right, and so that is your gift with uh, a donation of $100 or more to our Love Gift program. You'll also get the teaching with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson uh, called The Scroll Untold. It's a great teaching, and uh, there's more to come with mm -hmm. a gift of $300 or more, but we're out of time. We're out of time. So we will <laughs> we'll let the commercial tell it all. Much. All right, <laughs> you have too much fun, that's right. <laughs> all right, so Ephesians chapter six is the blueprint for what's coming next, who we need to be, and how it's all going to go down. But the big question is, are you ready? Alan Aguirre explains next, but first, it's The Kiddish with Michael. Stay tuned. <laughs> When Keith Johnson purchased a centuries-old scroll, he got more than he bargained for. And now, after sharing the scroll's surprising oddities on Shabbat Night Live, Keith Johnson and Nehemia Gordon are revealing the best surprises of all in this month's Love Gift teaching. He said, Keith, I don't know if anyone's ever been able to show this sort of thing this way. Didn't you not say that? I, I don't know that anybody in, ever has taken something like this microscope and showed it to a, to a audience that wasn't a bunch of academics at a conference. In this month's Love Gift teaching, The Scroll Untold, Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson share the best kept secrets of one very unique scroll. From mystery markings to rabbinic rule bending, you'll love every minute of this eye-opening story. Right now, for a limited time, you can get your copy of The Scroll Untold by donation. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you The Scroll Untold on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you The Scroll Untold, plus an incredibly soft microfiber blanket depicting Yehovah's appointed times, available only from a Rude Awakening International. Or as a special offer, for a donation of $300, we'll send you The Scroll Untold, the blanket featuring Yehovah's appointed times, plus a silver-plated kidder set with four wine cups decorated with scenes from ancient Jerusalem. These are special gifts from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Don't wait. The Scroll Untold is available only until October 31st and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts. 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. When the resurrected saints are gathered together on the sea of fire and glass for the 10 days of awe, the 10 days of inspection, and then getting dressed for the marriage supper of the Lamb, we wait to hear if our name is called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, into the Mishkan in heaven, where Yeshua will sit at the head of the table, where, as John says, he sees the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of Yeshua, and he is sitting on it, and we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and this is when Yeshua's promise is finally fulfilled. He told his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, when he blessed the Most High with the prayer of the Melech Zadik, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem, mean our rest. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. I am your provision. By my stripes you will be healed. And then Yeshua, as he took his cup and he passed it around to his disciples, he said, I will not drink this again till I drink it with you, my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will take his cup and he will say again, this represented and still represents the renewing of the covenant, the covenant that offered to make you priest and kings I paid the death penalty. I paid the price for the broken covenant. And now, now you get to drink with me in my Father's kingdom. You are the ones that are going to live and reign with me upon the earth for a thousand years because I paid the price. Until the marriage supper of the Lamb, we do this in remembrance of him. Shabbat Shalom. Before battle, 
Your spiritual authority is to encourage you, saying, do not be afraid, don't be scared, don't panic, don't be terrified. Adonai, your God, is going, to, is going with you and before you. He will fight for and help you and triumph in battle on your behalf against your enemies. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to do it all. It means you have to go with him. That's the premise of this book, Exodus to Ingathering, a field manual from Alan Aguirre. Welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me back. You know, I, I love this book because it, it instructs people that, uh, you know, Yeshua is coming back, but he's not going to do it all. We have to be with him. That's what the book says. That's why we need to equip ourselves. So we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. Um, regarding the, the instructions and warning Paul has that we're not to be ignorant about. And, and number one, I think, is that we have to show up. That's number one. And then we need to, need to equip ourselves. So how do, we, uh, how do we equip ourselves and what instructions do we le- need to learn for that, that time? Right. Uh, equipping, I mean, it, it really does come down to submitting to the scriptural narrative. Mm. Something Israel had a hard time doing, <laughs> something we have a hard time doing. Um, that's why I tell people all the time we're, we're exactly like Israel. And if we understood that we were just like Israel, maybe that would, it should help us avoid the pitfalls that Israel. It's not that Israel couldn't obey. It's that they wouldn't obey. Mm. And the same with us. It's not like, it's not like we can't obey. We just won't. And we're on this side of Golgotha. We're on this side of Calvary. We're on this side of Pentecost. We have Messiah has, 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 uh, has come, died, and risen from the dead. And that the same spirit and power that rose from the dead dwells within us. That's what it says. And then, and then we've got Pentecost with the, I mean, the Holy Spirit, yeah, shows up in the Old Testament, but now we have the indwelling of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. Mm. So we're on this side of all of that. You would think, well, we should know that God says that we have everything, we are fully equipped for the task. Again, part of our identity is that we don't actually necessarily believe that. But Mm. we are absolutely equipped for the task at hand. And we live when we live and where we live based on his sovereign will for our lives. It's, again, alignment. Mm. We have to align with the kingdom principles on earth as it is in heaven. So the equipping, first and foremost, it's like when we send, send one of our children to, base, uh, to, to boot camp, right? These, not everyone that goes to the military is ready for something like that. They probably don't have the disciplinary skill sets necessary, but see, but that's what that training is going to do to them. It's going to equip them. And it begins with the, right, the, 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 uh, the mind and the body together, mm-hmm. uh, waking up early and the, the chores and all the disciplinary acts, skills to make that person into a soldier. Mm-hmm. Well, those, that same equipping is necessary, it's crucial, it's, it's imperative that we have the same spiritual training, because it is spiritual. Don't even think for a second that it's not. It's all spiritual. This is absolutely spiritual. We have to have the same equipping and training as you would get in a boot camp, spiritually, to acquire, obtain the skill sets. We need to have the muscle memory, and the, it has to become uh, like, like breathing. It has to become our nature. See, it's supernatural. It's still natural. It's just super. Somebody else says that, right? <laughs> Somebody has coined that. And it, but it's absolutely true. And we have to make it our... Elijah asked the Lord uh, to open up the eyes of his servant so he could see the chariots of fire. That was mm. his, that, but that was his normal. We have to start... Walking in that in the normalcy of God's spiritual realm, and that is going to. How do we get there? How do we do that? Well, it's these. It's these uh, exercises, the training, right? It's like it's like golf, muscle memory, right? Right, and the same training, the same principles uh, apply here in the spiritual realm. 
for our equipping for to do spiritual battle. And that's why you, you wrote this book, right? Exodus to Ingathering a Field yeah. Manual, because you want it to be, a, it's a weekly thing. You can't just right. it's, you know, swing a golf club once no. and expect to win the PGA Tour. Fact, <laughs> yesterday, my wife was actually, my wife works for a, a nonprofit in, in Park City, Utah. And um, so it's funded by the wealth of the city. And one of them was talking about how he's up so far this season, he's played like golf 55 times. And it's the, and he's and he's scoring under ninety. It's the best golf he's played in his whole life. And I, and so my both my son and I. Well, yeah, that's because he's playing like he's played fifty times in the last month or something crazy like that. It's the same thing. It's the same exact thing uh, with, the, with the, the repetitiveness and the, the doing. It's um. It, it really does come down to that. It comes down to. We, as humans, we don't do what we don't like to do. I don't like to run five miles in the morning, so I don't guess what I don't do. I don't get up in the morning and run five miles. I know it's hard for you to believe that, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. We don't do, as humans, what we don't like to do. So, as, as people deficient, spiritually deficient, we have to, just like training, hmm. these spiritual things, spiritual calisthenics for the training to, to be equipped yeah, for warfare. Now, what kind of warfare are we coming up against here? I mean, what are we talking about? We saw what happened with the, uh, the Israelites, uh, and then Paul warns us not to be... Uh, right, I, I, you know, and, and as history goes, you can see it getting more and more intense right. and more and more real. So what are we heading toward? Why do we need to equip ourselves? Why do we need to have the full armor of God, as, right. as uh, Paul calls it? Well, I, I believe that Ephesians 6 is what we are looking forward to. That's what we get to look forward to, mm -hmm. Ephesians 6. We are expected, according to Ephesians 6, to do warfare with cosmic powers of ruling darkness. I mean, it's bad. I mean, I, we actually break it down in here, the various translations of Ephesians 6. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... I mean, it's bad. It's like really bad, supernatural, otherworldly, outside of our dimensional realm, ability to perceive authority of darkness that we're supposed to do warfare against and be victorious. We, we, can, we can't remember to turn the light off when we leave the room, let alone that. So we thought the Nephilim were big. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> you see, the, the Nephilim are, are, are actually created beings. Mm -hmm. Right, they're half human and half immortal. They're giants, right? So they're they're they're, they're half half breeds, half breeds. I think Enoch uses the, uses that term. Mm. No, we're talking about something else. We're talking about actual governing, ruling authorities of cosmic powers and cosmic darkness. Mm. How are we going to do that? That's what's coming. I mean, if you read Revelation, what's here's what's coming: a false prophet that is absolutely capable of deceiving the entire institution of Christendom. Hmm. And it says that if it wasn't for the, the, the days being shortened, even the elect would be deceived. Okay, what about the rest of them, right? Um, a beast system that is going to be completely demonic and against us. And we will be on their list, if not hmm. already. And, and, and an antichrist, the antichrist. We're talking about the Luciferian warlord of the earth in physical form with supernatural powers and abilities and with alliances that are probably not of this world. Hmm. Are they alien? Are they demonic? Are they extraterrestrial? I think all of the above. Are they interdimensional? I mean, Ephesians 6 uses some crazy language. How are we going to combat those things? One, we have to have the spiritual discernment to know it's even happening or that it's even them over there, you know, those things or whatever. The spiritual discernment, and how are we going to get that spiritual discernment? Well, we better be functioning at a high level of spirituality. Why do you think Paul, see, Paul understood this. Paul talked about these, these things that were going to come. Peter talked about it. Jude. And Paul says, man, I, 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 you, you need to be prophesying and you need to be speaking in tongues. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Why? Why would he say that if it wasn't something, a, if it wasn't also a part of what he was writing about when it comes to Ephesians 6? You know, um, how did Jesus, how did Jesus combat Lucifer in the, in the desert? Well, one, he quoted correctly and contextually the Torah. Well, so knowing the scriptures is going to come in handy. Actually walking out the scriptures, living out the scriptures, act observing. Deuteronomy 6 is a great place for you to start, mom and dad, right? Mm. Start with Deuteronomy 6. This is the kingdom lifestyle. These are, these are the battle tactics. We have to know this stuff. If we've got Deuteronomy 6 going, it says you, your son, and your son's son will walk in faith. That's a great place to start. Then what happens with that? Well, you're keeping the commandments. You're keeping the covenants. You're keeping the... The, the, what, how, how do we describe it in here? We're talking about the, we're talking about the different, uh, the, the, not only the rules of engagement, but the, the commandments that, yeah, yes. that come with this, uh, this boot camp stuff, right? That means you're going to be eating clean, which is going to keep, make it difficult for you to eat something you shouldn't be eating that could do some spiritual harm down the road. Uh, you're going to be walking clean. You're going to make sure you're going to keep yourself intact, right? You're an image bearer. Don't defile the image, right? Um, you're going to be you're going to you're going to be abstaining from paganism and every various forms of paganism, especially mm. religious observances of paganism, which are incredibly subtle. What else? Um, we're going to be fasting and praying, and we're going to be in the Word and doing the Word, and and oh yeah, the Holy Spirit peace. We're on this side of Pentecost. Speaking in tongues, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. You know, Jesus flexed, flexed those muscles. He, he spoke the Torah contextually against Lucifer in the desert. And then he did battle on, in the earth realm with the authority of the spirit realm. Uh, whether it was, like we mentioned earlier, a, a couple shows ago, whether it was forgiving sin or raising the cripples, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears. And that goes a long way to telling the world around us, the lost world around us, that there's an Elohim in Israel. You know, and we're, and, and we're doing this to make his name great. We're supposed to be preparing a people for him. Hmm. How do you prepare people for him when you're under siege during, if you're under occupation, if you're in, at war, in wartime? Well, you go and you rescue the hostages. <laughs> yeah. You go and do something. Right. Like we were talking about all before. This, yeah, all this is proactivity. But you know what? As humans, we don't do what we don't like to do, and, and we also don't do what we don't find value in. If you don't see value in driving four hours to get equipped, you're not going to go four hours to go get equipped. Right. I will. I do. Why? Because this is important stuff. It's not just important for me. It's important for me and my, my, my family. Mm-hmm. It's important for my family line, my legacy, my line. But it's also important because God wills it. This is his sovereign will for me is to walk in alignment with his precepts and covenants. And... It's not, being a, it's not about being a good soldier, and it's not about being a good servant. No, it's, again, it's sonship. And sonship, obedience, breeds sonship, I think. And that's just it, having to, or knowing our, knowing our place, knowing our sonship. Knowing right. We, 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 I'm a man under authority, mm-hmm. you know, and, let, if, and let's go with the military uh, uh, analogies again. Knowing your place, are you a major, a corporal, a private, a sergeant? You've got a chain of command. You've got mm-hmm. an upline, right? And you have to, and, and obeying your commanding officers, obeying your upline, they tell you, man, that, that you want to stay alive. You, you obey that line, that chain of command. So you have, uh, you have Paul obeying the instruction of James and Acts to uh, not only to dispute the rumors that you're, that you're anti-Torah and teach against Torah, go pay for these four guys to fulfill their Nazarite vow and take the vow yourself. Everybody will know that you now live an orderly life mm-hmm. and keep the Torah. So here's Paul submitting to his upline. 
and then Paul's down to Timothy. You know, it's, this is the order. This is the, that's the, the, the line of command. Hmm. So what is our line of command today when we're, when we're looking at that scenario? Who do we... Right. Well, unfortunately, most Christians don't have a, an upline like... They don't have apostles and prophets in their denomination or mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, I'm lucky to have... Uh, my entire Christian life, I've had apostles and prophets in my life. Um, so what does it look like? Most of the time, it's a pastor. You have a pastor. If your pastor don't, don't know about this, this kind of stuff, you're probably not being taught this kind of stuff, which is why, thank goodness, we have you know, a rude awakening. We have the, the ministries that we have. You know, whether it's a rude awakening or, or even chameleon church, you know, and what we do. Because we're offering this information to people. That's why, and we've partnered together. Mm-hmm. Here we are together. Two distinct ministries, you know, saying the same thing to various people in various ways. But it's, it's, it's one spirit. It's one doctrine. And, and we're just, we're linking shields together to, to, to bring this information to other people. That's what that upline looks like. I mean, as much as, as much as physical, tangible fellowship at a church body, I mean, that is crucially important. I can't stress that enough. But there are a lot of people out there that, can't, uh, that either can't find a, a trusted uh, place to fellowship or they live too far away or they're in, unable to get to a place because maybe because of disability or whatever. So they have you know, the, the, the formats that we offer. Um, but, man, it is so important to be under submission and, and walking in accountability. And so we, make, we, we offer that type of, um, I'll, I'll call pastoral, I'll call it pastoral care. I've never used that term, <laughs> but I'll, I'll use it here. Um, I mean, we just did Shavuot, right? Um, is a, I, use, I use Shavuot as a good example because... There's, there's, a, there's a, a, an observance in Shavuot that we can do via the web. Okay, so four months ago or whatever, how long, ever long ago it was, we, you're supposed to bring two pieces, two loaves of bread to your priest, to the mm-hmm. priest or your pastor or whatever, your spiritual authority. And they wave it for you, wave sheaf offering, as well as a free will offering. I was in Nashville at the time, but I had people calling me. I had a, a family from Brazil call me. With their, with their bread. Huh. And I was able to do a, you know, a, a proxy wave sheaf offering for them and a blessing for them. And, and you know, uh, a, a family in Wales made their phone call. You know, uh, the people here in the States. It, looks, it can look like that too, you know. Um, but nothing substitutes tangible fellowship. Do you think that's part of the tactic? Well, whether people realize that, that they're doing that or not, this whole thing where everyone's had to go on to Zoom or any some other platform in the world because no one was allowed to get together for a time Crazy. and all this. Do you think that's part of a, a darker agenda that no one's really seeing here? To, so, to separate people and not have that connection? I think so. So a part of so I've been doing a show, the Chameleon Church show we do on Tuesday morning, I've been doing for over three years. Okay. You know, we come out with this, these field, you know, again, this is a series of, of field manuals. Mm-hmm. We've got two now, and one's coming out this spring. And we decided to create a Monday night um, online Bible study. So, I, so it's interactive. It's on Zoom, so there's interaction, mm-hmm. right? Q&A. I read through the, the weekly dev- the devotional, and then, you know, and they have it, so they've read two. And they've taken their notes because we've got, you know, a place for field notes here at the end of every, every uh, devotional. Mm-hmm. You write your notes. And then there's this interactive Q&A. And it's on Zoom. So it's interactive. We're also on YouTube and Facebook at the same time, simulcast. So we figured out how, you know, how to do this. Towards the end of 2019, I felt impressed, again, the prophetic spirit of God, mm-hmm. to up my, I was calling it tele-evangelist <laughs> portion of my ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's, 
that's kind of what it felt like. And it was kind of a little, not, not uncomfortable, but it's like, how am I supposed to become that guy? Mm -hmm. I, I'm a rock and roll singer, right? Yeah. Um, I, but I really felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to, to up my live streaming, right? portion mm -hmm. of our ministry. I couldn't understand why. So I did. Lights, cameras, mm -hmm. uh, software. And then this thing happened. Oh. Right? I, uh, in 2019, I was gone once a month, May through October, hmm. speaking. I came here, conferences, churches. I was all over the country for like most of the year, speaking and teaching on, on their books. Now I can't go anywhere, even if I want to, because because I'm, I'm, I was I was I was still active mm -hmm. in 2020, but I, a lot of people were shut down. I couldn't go to places, but because of like you're saying Zoom right. or the internet, because of the internet, I was able to enter into people's homes and lives and bring encouragement and instruction and teaching. And, I, and, and he, he prompted me to get to prepare for that before it happened. But now it's like, okay, but, but here's my thing. So we do, so every Monday night we meet. We've, met, we've been meeting every Monday night since March of 2020 online, and it's growing. Mm. How do we transfer your Holy Spirit, Father, through this medium? Because, right, you and I sitting in a room, oh, you're sick, let me, can I anoint you with oil and lay hands on you mm -hmm. and pray for you, right? Whether it's for healing or for whatever. Uh, uh, you, uh, 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 gifting, you know, I want to speak in tongues or I want to prophesy or whatever. Boom, right? That's how it's done. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, what the, 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 that's what the true field manual says, mm -hmm. you know, the Bible. How do I do this, Father, from, through this medium? And so I really pressed into, into that. I want to be able to transfer your anointing and, and, it's, and it's happened. Mm -hmm. um, so whether... Regardless of so, what comes, go right. Ahead. So speaking in tongues and prophecy were the two biggest ones. Mm -hmm. And so we went, all right, by the time we're done with this one, you guys need to be functioning these things. And, and, and we've gotten the testimonies that that's actually happening. So I think the enemy, see, I think the enemy's behind what's going on. I don't think it's the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it's God. I think it's the enemy. And so... We know that the enemy's, see, we know the enemy's going to do what he's going to do. It shouldn't be surprising to us. We also know that this stuff has to happen in order for Messiah to return. Mm -hmm. And it has to get worse in order for Messiah to return. So we don't have to fear it, right. right? What's coming is ancient, but we don't have to fear it because we serve the ancient in days. Right. Right? And the but God can also use, I mean, how many times has, has the enemy done something in the biblical narrative, in the scriptural narrative, and God's gone and then used it for his glory and for his magnification and for the furthering of his people and his agenda mm -hmm. all the time. Right. So regardless of what happens, Yehovah allows it to happen. He is sovereign. But, yeah, exactly. He, he is sovereign. sovereign and he can do whatever he wants. And that's why my sword is his, because that's the right thing to do. All right. We're going to talk about what's possibly coming next and how we can combat it. So if you are enjoying this as much as I do, Alan Aguirre, thank you for bringing him here because you did it with your donations. And so we're going to ask you to consider that again for the next two minutes. We'll be right back.
and thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. We've been talking with Alan Aguirre about this Exodus to Ingathering Field Manual. And a field manual is given to those in the military to let them know what they're doing, to recognize their enemy, to come up with tactics to defeat such enemies. We really need to know our enemy, and uh, Alan, that may not be who we're thinking of. You know, when we, when we speak of the Nephilim and the uh, Israelites coming into the land, that was who they were battling. But yes, they were battling Nephilim, but who did they have to come up against themselves? First, their own thoughts. That was the enemy. The Nephilim they could have defeated, but they couldn't defeat their own thoughts. And uh, is that the same thing we're, we're thinking here where you know, the battle tactics in these days prepare us for battle, and we say it's a, it's a spiritual battle, and we mention all these demonic spirits and all this kind of thing, and, and it seems very scary, but could it be something a little more close to our heart, like our own religion? Would that, yeah. would that be an enemy we have to come up against? Yeah. I, 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 it's very interesting. I, I, our, our readership, mm -hmm. our viewership, our listening and viewing audience, and our readership, Man, they run the gamut from, you know, traditional Protestant evangelicals, mm -hmm. charismatics, and then Torah observers, and then Torah observant charismatics, hmm. right? So, I mean, we really do cover all that, you know, and so... So the challenges that we face, what these people are facing are, if you're an evangelical that doesn't observe Torah or isn't charismatic, we've got those two things, right, with them. Well, you know, you do realize Jesus did do these things, and it could be, we could be talking about Torah or charismatica, because he, he did both. And here's why you need to, or here's why you should, you know? Mm-hmm. And then when you deal with the charismatics, it's the same thing. Okay, now it's like, okay, well, you know, Jesus wore tassels. He didn't, you know, he observed Passover instead of Easter, for example. And, and he spoke in tongues, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you, and then yeah. when you deal with the, the Torah people that are anti, a lot of them are anti-charismatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, a, that's a hard nut because it's like, it's the same as group one Christians that aren't charismatic or observe mm -hmm. Torah, but now they, but now all of a sudden they observe Torah, but they're still anti-charismatic, and it's it's because a lot of them just they're just it's they brought the same baggage they had in traditional Christianity that kept them from whatever. It's the same baggage is just now under Torah, which actually is worse mm. because now they have this. It's like their religious spirit is on steroids now because of Torah. And that's just even more dangerous. And Paul addresses that a lot. I mean, God addresses that in the Old Testament mm -hmm. a lot. You know, at least keep the vows that you made for yourself, you know? Okay, yeah. you know, we'll take, we'll put the uh, bulls and goats on the, off the table, but you gotta at least keep the vows. Mm -hmm. You know, in the same way Paul says, your, your circumcision doesn't value you anything if you're not keeping the Torah. Yeah, Paul uh, put, uh, put the focus on himself and said, look, I'm, I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. I was perfect. I get it. Came. Yeah, it's like, I can't, I can't be saved through my own knowledge. Right, right, right. And so a lot, of, a lot of that happens with that group. And then you have those that, I, they're, they're firing on, on almost all cylinders. I mean, they're, they're observing the, the commandments, they're keeping mm -hmm. Torah, and they're charismatic. And see, and so, and so the other three groups, I have to constantly be reminding them that, look, in your New Testament, you have Messiah and his disciples. They're mm -hmm. Torah-observant charismatics. So where's the disconnect? And again, it's the, it's the religious spirit. Jesus had thousands and thousands of followers, and he knew that they were following him because he was feeding them, not because he was Messiah. And so what does he tell them? He tells them, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Gave them no explanation. Well, that's cannibalism. That's against the Torah. This is a hard saying. Who can, who can keep it? And they all turned from him. And then he looks at the 12 and he goes, are you going to leave me? And they said, well, no, you have the, the words of eternal life. And he goes, well, didn't I choose you? Mm. So there's a difference between many are called. There's a difference between being called and being chosen. The chosen might not have the understanding, but they're, they, but they're believing in the sovereignty of the messenger. 
the called have a hard time wrapping whatever is being said around their, you know, they're having a hard time wrapping their mind around it because of that religious spirit. Well, no, this can't be God. God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't say that or he wouldn't make me so mm. uncomfortable like that. So there's a line. They have a line that God wouldn't cross. And so since God won't cross that line, that can't be God. Mm. Well, if God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not, are not our thoughts, every revelation from God through the Holy Spirit should be offended, offending, uh, offensive towards us because it's not in our, in our paradigm. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the key, though, is not to become religious, is not to allow our religious spirit to say, that's not possible. God would never use a man like that. All right. God would never use a, 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 a guy that's an adulterer or whatever. God would never use someone I don't believe is a Christian. God would never use Cyrus, a pagan that he calls my son, my anointed, because he does. In Isaiah. So those thoughts that we have are the giants that we need to overcome in a I lot think, of cases. I think they can, I, yes, I believe giants can be our thoughts as well as actually something physically tangible or something right. demonically tangible. And we have to get past our mind first because look at the Israelites. Right. They could have defeated the Nephilim well, as as. Uh, Joshua and Caleb said they could, but they couldn't get past their own thoughts and even cross over into the land to try. Right, and what do we find out later? We find out later that the Nephilim, the Canaanites, are afraid of Israel. Mm -hmm. We find that's why they call on Balaam. Right, well, you look at Yeshua. Whenever he entered into a place where there were uh, demons, they would back away saying, whoa, son of man, get away from us. Please, please get out of here. Because they were afraid of him. Why, if we have that same spirit, why would they not be afraid of us? It's what you said before, many times through our conversations here, was that we need to understand who we are. Yeah. And that we do have dominion over these guys. And as soon as you realize that, your power is yours. Now, I wanted to ask you something interesting. because you said because, Okay, so I came from a Pentecostal church. We used to be leaders in a Pentecostal church. And then when we came to know Torah and what, you know, all these things that, that come with it, we're like, oh, wow, you know, it's, we were completely wrong, is what we thought. <laughs> and so we took anything to do with uh, speaking in tongues or anything like that. Or We never had that figured out in the first place. We always kind of wondered about that. We put it on the shelf. We didn't know what to do with it. And it remains on the shelf to this day. So I was puzzled. Maybe Are you, did you want me to lay hands on you right now and you start speaking in tongues <laughs> on camera? <laughs> Here's what I want you to explain, is that you said, because I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers would be confused too, and say, what does Alan mean that Yeshua was a Torah observant. Uh, charismatic. Charismatic. How would, where do we see evidence that Yeshua was speaking in tongues? I just, I guess, for right. the benefit of we, our audience. We don't actually, it, it never actually ever says anywhere that he spoke in tongues, okay. but we have no reason to believe that he didn't. Okay. Simply because, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the gateway gift. Speaking, I've never met anybody that prophesied Heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, or did you know any of that stuff? Mm-hmm. Right? Because there's gifts and then there's greater gifts, right? According to Paul in sure. Corinthians 12 and 14. I've never known a single person that could do those things that did not speak in tongues. Mm. I I would be surprised if Jesus didn't speak in tongues. Why wouldn't he have spoken in tongues? You know, he spent a lot of his time praying alone and all that. I guarantee you he was speaking mm-hmm. in tongues. Why wouldn't he have been speaking in tongues? Sim- simply because it says, because it, it doesn't say that he did? I don't... Interesting. Well, and then like John says, to, to, to your credit, that there's many things, there's so many things sure. that he said and did, where there's no way possible sure. he could have written everything down. Okay, so where do we go from there? Well, Jesus does say... My disciples, here are the signs that will follow my disciples. This is how you'll know they're mine. They will speak in tongues, Mm. heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Right? And then we see evidence of that throughout the New Testament, and we see evidence of their teaching that. Mm. You know, Paul, again, uh, chapters 12 and 14 of Corinthians. I, I want, you should, you all, you, 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 you need to, all of you need to be prophesying and speaking in tongues, he said, mm-hmm. and to pursue the greater gifts, right? Um, gifts of miracles, things of that nature, you know, right. dream interpretation, interpretation of tongues, mm-hmm. you know? Prophecy is huge, but only other prophets can judge prophets, you know? It's like, right. you know, a garage band can't judge me, 
musically or whatever, because I'm, you know, I'm, that type sure. of thing. So I think I, I really truly believe uh, things like fasting, prayer, knowing, eating the word, and functioning in your spiritual giftings and your gift clusters, functioning in the supernatural, just like Jesus did, just like the disciples did, mm -hmm. just like we were told, you know, that we would be doing greater things than this, mm -hmm. on and on and on and on and on, uh, are the are, are vital tools for the succeeding of this war mm -hmm. that we're in. Now, here's another point. Because it is spiritual, the war. Yes, and, and here's another point that I want to make. Even by just asking you that, and I'm sure like, if people had doubts about that, I want to bring it out that that in itself can be a giant that you can't get past. Absolutely. And you dwell on that, and you focus on that, and yeah. you get angry about it, and you don't just say to yourself and admit it that, okay, yeah. I don't get it right now. Let me put that aside and move on to the things I can do. Right. Well, here's the thing. Jesus wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. And Paul, I believe, is a legitimate apostle of, uh, of Messiah. That's even up for question in some circles, <laughs> which is why I said it the way I just said it. But, and, and Paul said, you got to be speaking in tongues and prophesying, hmm. right? Spiritual songs and all that, right? Because this thing is spiritual. So with that in mind, a lot of people in the Torah community actually believe that what I am describing as charismatic speaking in tongues, healing the sick, casting mm -hmm. out demons, laying on of hands, uh, all, that, all that stuff is actually demonic. They call it kundalini. Mm -hmm. Now that's dangerous because Jesus himself was, uh, was accused of functioning in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit, in the Ruach HaKodesh, as demonic. He does this, and he casts out demons in the name of Beelzebub. Aha. That's what they, saw, that's what they accused yep. him of. And he said that that he said that any that attributing the spirit of God to demonism or to the demonic was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and there's no coming back from that. You, there's no forgiveness for that. Mm. That's how dangerous that is. And I can't tell you how many people have flat out said, "Oh, you think you're a prophet? That's that's the devil." Oh, you mm. think that you think you're you, that's prophecy? You believe in prophecy? That's not prophecy. That's the devil. Oh, speaking in tongues? That's demonic. You know they believe a lot of the Torah people believe that charismatica, or all things charismatic. They call it kundalini. Now, that's that is so incredibly dangerous. I mean, my pork eating Christian friends are better off than they are because. Mm. It doesn't say that eating pork is blasphemy. It just says you won't be able to go up to Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai to, to worship him in Isaiah. That doesn't mean they're not in. They're just on the outside mm. fringe. Interesting. Right? Yep. But they're still in. Jesus said, calling the Holy Spirit demonic, and when you call that kundalini, that that's blasphemy, and there's no coming back from that. And spiritual maturity, I guess in a sense, is... If we don't get that, if we don't understand it, just admit it and move on. Right. You know what? I've only gotten this. I've gotten this close to healing the sick. I mean, uh, raising the dead once when I was eighteen. Mm. That doesn't mean I don't. So right. So it didn't happen. I've not raised. Technically, I have not raised the dead. I don't do what the majority do, and then and and what is that? Dismiss it. Oh, that's not real then. That's not real, or that's not for today, or, you know, God, whatever. No, <laughs> that's not mature. That's, that's, that's insane. That's not mm -hmm. even logical. No, that just means I haven't raised the dead yet. Yeah. Will I ever raise the dead? I don't know. But it doesn't mean that ability or gifting isn't available or real or true. I haven't transported like Philip yet either. You know, in fact, the whole, all the disciples, it says, it says that when Jesus got into the boat, they were immediately on the other, other you know. Mm -hmm. I haven't transported yet, like Philip. That doesn't mean I don't believe that that gift is, a, is, a, is real or available, mm -hmm. you know. Just because I have cast out demons doesn't mean that's why I believe it. No, you right. know what? I believe it because it says it. 
I haven't seen Jesus, but I believe he's real. I have, you know what I'm saying? I haven't yeah. tangibly, mm-hmm. tangibly seen him like this, like I see you right now. That doesn't right. mean, see, so that, that type of thinking is, is real faulty. Oh, well, oh, those, I've, oh, I've, I've, I've got, you know, how many, I can't tell you how many times people tell me about their bad experience of false speaking in tongues. That wasn't really speaking in tongues. And, and, they, and it's whatever they said it was. To discredit it, it's like, have you ever heard a bad song on the, on, on the radio? Yeah. Did you stop listening to music because of it? Well, no, that's mm. stupid. Yeah, I know. That would be stupid for you to discredit what it is that we're talking about because you had a bad experience or you've never experienced it. Now, you, on the other hand, you need to pick that gift off to the shelf, man, and uh, start <laughs> worshiping your God. <laughs> That's right. No, this is a great perspective. And I think part of that comes from your perspective is living in another country where these things were a lot more common Absolutely. than they are here. So, and that's how I, you know, when I got, I got saved at a healing service in Central America. Mm-hmm. And um, it was an American that was there that, we, that my uncle's church had sponsored. Mm-hmm. And people were getting, and after he spoke, people were getting prayed for. And there was testimonies of eyes and limbs and, you know. And I'm like, and they said, so what do you think? Because I, I wasn't saved. What did you think? And, you know, and I'm like, well, I think, yeah. If there's a God and he's the king of the universe, well, of course this is possible. That's, right. It would be Completely ludicrous to think that that's not even tangibly possible, hmm. right? And then, so, so I, I submit. I prayed. We, I prayed the the prayer, or whatever. And when I opened up my eyes, something had physically altered. My eyesight was physically altered, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can see. And the guy praying for me thought I was speaking Christianese. Look at man, I don't speak Christianese then or now. Okay, <laughs> that's just not who I am. No. I can see something has physically happened to my eyes, and he got worried. Mm. You can see the look, and it's like, uh oh, you know? And I explained to him, everything's brighter, the mm. colors are more vivid, you know? And here's how I explained it it's as if I've had mesh lining over my eyes, and now it's gone. I knew nothing, I had no reference. Nothing. I had no biblical reference, no religious reference. I was a pure 100% punk rock pagan guy Mm -hmm. that all of a sudden got saved. I knew nothing about scales and Paul and no, Mm. I knew nothing about anything. So I had this physical thing happen. The supernatural is, the supernatural is more real than this. Let's get into that more next episode. The reality of the spirit and what's coming our way. Okay, Alan, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We have at least one more to go. So join us next week for Shabbat Night Live with Alan Aguirre as we talk about the reality of the spirit, even if you've never seen it. How does that translate to our minds? So we'll see you next week. Until then, Shavua Tov. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.